Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Today, we have another figure who was involved with the Harlem Renaissance, but has not become nearly as well-known as a lot of her peers. Olivia Ward Bushbanks was a writer who also supported writers and artists. I mean, she didn't she didn't have a lot of a ton of money to do that with, but with the means that she had, she tried to support other people. She also hosted salons, she taught drama courses, and she was well known enough during her lifetime that when she was mentioned in society columns and articles about activities that she was involved with, People wrote about her in a way that suggested that the readers of the newspaper or the magazine or whatever would already know who she was. But as of right now, most of the more recent writing about her has not been things like a full-length biography or a historical analysis in the form of a book. It's been more like PhD dissertations and the introduction to a collected edition of her work that came out at this point 30 years ago. Uh, as part of a series on 19th century Black women writers. In addition to the things that I've already mentioned, Olivia Ward Bushbanks was also a social worker and a single mom and tribal historian for the Montauket Nation at a time when that nation had just been stripped of its lands and its recognition in New York, all of which we are going to talk about today. Olivia Ward was born on February 27, 1869, in Sag Harbor, New York, on eastern Long Island. And she was the youngest of Abraham and Eliza Draper Ward's three children. At various points in her life, she wrote autobiographical statements that describe her parents and their ancestry. In one, she says, quote, both parents possessed some Negro blood and were also descendants of the Montauk tribe of Indians. And in another, she describes her father as, quote, a mixture of Portuguese, East Indian, and Negro. This is more of a clarification or a richer level of detail rather than a contradiction. A lot of the first enslaved Africans who were taken to this part of North America had been captured from Spanish and Portuguese ships. The people aboard had often been trafficked through the Cape Verde Islands off the western coast of Africa, These islands were a primary port in the slave trade, and they were under Portuguese control. The Montauket Nation is described in many historical documents, including ones by Olivia herself as the Montauk. That was the name that was more commonly used until about the 1990s. This is an Algonquian-speaking nation related to other indigenous nations on the eastern end of what's now Long Island, as well as nations from what's now New England, including the Peacot and the Narragansett. These nations spoke different Algonquian dialects that were mutually understandable, and the Montauket nation seems to have spoken one that was similar to the Mohegan Pequot language. A written vocabulary was recorded in the late 18th century, and by the 19th century, only a few members of the Montauket nation still spoke it. It is, however, one of the Algonquian languages that's part of the Algonquian Language Revitalization Project today. Sag Harbor had some parallels to the community in and around New Bedford, Massachusetts that we talked about in our episode on Paul Cuffey, although he was born more than a century before Olivia Ward was. Both were originally home to indigenous nations who shared their whaling knowledge with European colonists. The resulting whaling industry in both places was exploitive, often extremely exploitive, But it was also possible for people of color to attain more wealth and status than they could in most other industries. The Ward family had historically been part of this industry, and Olivia's father lived with another family that was a key part of it starting when he was about 14. Another similarity between Sag Harbor and New Bedford, as well as some other parts of New York and New England, had to do with demographics. Europeans arriving on what's now Long Island enslaved indigenous people there, particularly indigenous men. Indigenous men were also more likely to be killed in warfare, both warfare between indigenous nations and warfare against Europeans. Simultaneously, most of the enslaved Africans that were brought to the area were men. So there were more African men, but more indigenous women. White Europeans considered both indigenous and African people to be a race apart, so it was common for indigenous and African people to marry and to have children, often indigenous women to African men. 
By the time Olivia Ward was born, just a few years after the U.S. Civil War, many people of color in the area had biracial or multiracial ancestry. When Olivia was about nine months old, her mother died, and her father moved to Providence, Rhode Island, with her and her siblings. According to family accounts, Abraham Ward was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and in the years just before Olivia's birth, he had also had another wife named Anne. There are census records that seem to back up the idea that Abraham was in a polygamous marriage, but otherwise we don't have a whole lot of detail here. However, there is some interesting speculation about how Latter-day Saints' beliefs about Native Americans being descended from a lost tribe of Israel might have affected him, including potentially influencing his decision to join the church. So after this move to Providence, Abraham remarried in 1871. And sometime after that, Olivia was sent to live with her maternal aunt, Mariah Draper. And her aunt had an enormous influence on her. Mariah taught Olivia about their indigenous heritage and took her to powwows and other gatherings, including on the Shinnecock Reservation on Long Island. Olivia described her aunt as making sacrifices for the sake of other people, which had kept her from being able to get an education for herself. But Olivia credited Mariah with making sure that she got a useful, practical education. In some accounts, this involves studying nursing during high school, and in others, Olivia trained to be a seamstress. In spite of that focus on a practical education, one of Olivia's great loves from high school was drama. Her teacher was named Miss Dodge, who ran the Dodge School of Dramatics. Dodge taught something called behavior drama, and at this point, no one has unearthed clear documentation about exactly what that meant. Olivia's own notes are pretty sketchy, and they reference emotion and interpretation of texts. Dodge thought Olivia was talented enough to give her private lessons, and Olivia went on to teach this method in her adult life. As a theater kid, I am incredibly curious about exactly what behavior drama was. Oh, for sure. Part of me is like, I bet I could piece this together, like backwards engineer it through like um, maybe acting classes I did in college, for sure. <laughs> In 1889 or 1890, when she was 20 or 21, Olivia Ward married Frank Bush, who was a tailor from South Carolina. They went on to have two daughters, Rosa Olivia and Marie. But this wasn't a happy marriage. For reasons that aren't really clear, the family moved to Boston. And when they got there, Frank started working as a janitor. That would have been a lot less lucrative than working as a tailor. By 1895, Frank and Olivia were divorced, and although Olivia continued to go by Olivia Ward Bush after this, she described this time in her life as, quote, extremely unfortunate. Her next few years were hard. She was a single mother raising two daughters, and because of her race, she was considered only for low-paying and often physically demanding or demoralizing work. She moved around, including living with her Aunt Mariah from time to time, just trying to make ends meet. When she started writing, it was with the hope that she might be able to earn some extra money to support her family. We will get more into that after a quick sponsor break. <music> Olivia Ward Bush's first book of poems was simply titled Original Poems, and it was published in Providence, Rhode Island in 1899. It was dedicated, quote, with profound reverence and respect to the people of my race, Afro-Americans. But the poems in it also draw from her indigenous heritage as well, including the poem Morning on Shinnecock. This is the first poem in the collection, and in it, a narrator looks out over a grand and wondrous spectacle of hills, a leafy grove, cornfields, a sea, before ending, quote, O morning hour, so dear thy joy, and how I longed for thee to last, but e'en thy fading into day brought me an echo of the past. T'was this how fair my life began, how pleasant was its hour of dawn, but merging into sorrow's day, then beauty faded with the morn. We don't know for sure whether Olivia Ward Bush was active in the temperance movement, but the second poem in this book, titled Treasured Moments, suggests that she at least had a favorable opinion of it. She characterizes temperance activists as, quote, women with hearts true and strong who dared to face a great evil, who dared to contend against wrong. <laughs> 
Several poems in this book celebrate figures from Black history, including Crispus Attucks, who also had both African and Indigenous ancestry. We really don't know much about Crispus Attucks' biography, but he's believed to have liberated himself from enslavement before becoming the first person to be killed at the Boston Massacre on March 5, 1770. Her poem, Crispus Attucks, describes him boldly striking the first blow as other Bostonians shrank from duty. It ends, quote, then write in glowing letters these thrilling words in history that Attucks was a hero, that Attucks died for liberty. A Hero of San Juan is about the Black infantry and cavalry units known as the Buffalo Soldiers at the Battle of San Juan Hill during the Spanish-American War. This poem frames the battle as helping to liberate Cuba from Spain. Quote, They fought for Cuban liberty. On Juan's hill those bloody stains. Mark how these heroes won the day and added honor to their names. Of course, there is a much bigger story to the Spanish-American War than just this poem, and we should note that there are some complexities to the greater story of the Buffalo Soldiers, since earlier in their history they were also part of the warfare against indigenous nations during the United States' Western expansion. Yeah, that's one of the reasons that even though I've had the Buffalo Soldiers on my list for a long time, I haven't figured out quite the best approach for it. This book, containing 10 poems in total, was generally well-received, and some of the poems were reprinted in other publications, including in the Boston Transcript. In a letter, Paul Lawrence Dunbar told Olivia that he liked it very much and that, quote, there is a high spiritual tone about it that is bound to please. For the next few years, Olivia Ward Bush continued to write. In about 1900, she became assistant drama director for Robert Gould Shaw Community House. That was a settlement house in Boston. We talked about the settlement house movement in our previous episode on Jane Addams. These were organizations intended to improve the lives of the poor and working class by providing things like child care, education, and social support, with the people doing that work living in the neighborhood they were serving. It's probably during this time that Bush began doing social work. A pamphlet on her that was published by the NAACP in about 1920 describes her as one of the most prominent social workers in Boston. During these years, Olivia started supporting her aunt in addition to her two daughters. Her aunt at this point was getting much older. And she also started working as the tribal historian for the Montauket Nation. It's not clear exactly when she started this work, but she continued until about 1916. And as we said at the top of the show, this was a critically important time for the preservation of Montauket oral histories and cultural knowledge because in 1910, the New York Supreme Court had declared the Montauk tribe extinct, stripping them of their lands on Long Island. So we need to back up a little bit to explain this decision. In the late 17th century, the Montauket Nation sold land to the proprietors of the village of East Hampton, negotiating the rights to live on and use that land in perpetuity. But it's clear that residents of East Hampton hoped that they would eventually have that land unconditionally. Later agreements that the Montauket Nation and East Hampton negotiated increasingly restricted Indigenous peoples' rights and land access, Then in 1754, the trustees of East Hampton got representatives from the Montauket Nation to sign an agreement that the Montaukets would not marry Africans or people from other indigenous nations. This same agreement gave the town the right to prosecute anyone of African descent or from another indigenous nation who tried to settle there. The trustees' rationale for this was twofold. On Long Island and elsewhere, white residents worried that if indigenous peoples welcomed people of African descent into their communities, then those communities would become a haven for people who had liberated themselves from slavery or would inspire slave uprisings. And it was also about trying to keep the Montauket population from growing or even maintaining itself. Intermarriages were common among the indigenous nations of this region. They helped each nation maintain its own population while also strengthening social and political ties among the nations. The agreement signed in 1754 meant that the Montaukets were allowed to marry only among themselves, but their population was just too small for that to be sustainable. Shortly after the Revolutionary War, After decades of warfare and increasing conflict with East Hampton and pressure from the town's trustees, 
A group of Montaukets who had converted to Christianity moved to Oneida land in New York's Mohawk Valley, establishing the Brothertown Nation. This was a Christian community built on an alliance of multiple Algonquian-speaking indigenous nations, and it excluded people of African ancestry. There's some suggestion that at least some Montaukets had adopted some of the same anti-Black attitudes that were held by most Europeans, and that some of the people who had signed that agreement back in 1754 were the same ones who then left to establish the Brothertown Nation. The Montaukets who remained on Long Island after this included people who didn't want to convert to Christianity, people who had African ancestry, and people who just did not want to leave their homes. In some cases, this divided families, with some moving to Brothertown and some staying behind. But again, the hope from East Hampton was that everyone in the Montauket Nation who had no African ancestry would go, which was not what happened. Another side to this is that in the view of the people of East Hampton, Montaukets who had African ancestry were not indigenous. They were Black, and Black and indigenous were mutually exclusive. And by the 1800s, the trustees started using that idea to argue that the Montauket Nation no longer existed and no longer had the land use rights that they had negotiated back starting in the 17th century. By the late 19th century, Montaukets living on eastern Long Island were facing enormous hostility from their white neighbors. In 1871, the nation tried to incorporate to get on a more equal legal footing. But that effort failed in the face of opposition from East Hampton. Newspaper coverage from this time was full of racist stereotypes, and it continually characterized the Montauket Nation as dying out. Seemingly every time a member of the nation died, there would be newspaper articles about the so-called last Montauk. In 1879, the East Hampton trustees filed a petition to partition Montauket land, which a judge approved. And the next year, the same judge approved the sale of the land. That totaled about 10,000 acres. Developer Arthur Benson bought it for $151,000. Benson wanted to work with railroad developer Austin Corbin to extend an existing railroad line to Montauk Point. But his purchase of the Montauket Nation's land wasn't enough for him to do that. The nation still had a lease dating back to 1703, giving the Montaukets the rights to live, hunt, and fish on the land in perpetuity, really a lot like their earliest negotiations with European colonists had done decades before that. So Benson and Corbin brought in the East Hampton town assessor, Nathaniel Dominey, to try to coerce the Montaukets off the land. Domini lied to people, telling them they would be allowed to return to the land whenever they wanted, even though he knew that was false. Some people were offered and accepted as little as $10 for their homes, but others refused to sell. Domini made increasingly lofty promises, things like lifetime annual payments or paying for an education for people's children. He didn't follow through on a lot of this, and he probably never intended to. These negotiations were also illegal since they went through individual tribal members rather than the nation as a whole. In 1895, the Montauket Nation hired a lawyer, and Benson's lawyers again put forth that argument that the Montaukets were Black and not Indigenous, and therefore were not protected by that 1703 lease. This argument worked from a couple of angles. One was the one-drop rule, which was the idea that a person with even one drop of so-called African blood was Black. And the other is the idea of blood quantum, which is basically the idea that a person has to have a certain amount of so-called native blood to be considered indigenous. Different indigenous nations have all had their own concepts of what it means to be indigenous and what it means to be a citizen. But broadly speaking... The one-drop rule and blood quantum are both ideas that originated from European colonists and their descendants in order to define who was white, who was Black, and who is indigenous, usually in a way that's discriminatory and restrictive. Court rulings and appeals went on for years in the effort to remove the Montauket Nation from their land, ultimately winding up before the state Supreme Court in 1910. 
State Supreme Court Judge Abel Blackmar issued a ruling that even though the New York State Constitution forbade the sale of indigenous land, the law that really applied was the Dongan Charter, which dated back to 1686 and had given the city of Albany the exclusive right to negotiate with indigenous people. Yeah, for some reason, the only provisions of the Dongan Charter that he was really focused on still being in force were these these ones, the ones that related to to people taking the Montauket Nation's land. Blackmar also stated, quote, There is now no tribe of Montauk Indians. It has disintegrated and been absorbed into the mass of citizens. If I may use the expression, the tribe has been dying for many years. There were a number of Montauket people in the courtroom when he made this statement. I saw numbers ranging between 25 and 75. The Montauket Nation appealed, but this decision was upheld in 1914. So Olivia Wardbush was acting as the Montauket Nation tribal historian in the wake of all of this. We'll talk some more about this toward the end of the episode, but for now, we're going to pause for a sponsor break. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of additional detail about Olivia Ward Bush's work as the Montauket Nation's tribal historian, but her second book, Driftwood, was published in 1914. This one was dedicated to her Aunt Mariah. Some sources list this book as having 25 poems and two prose pieces, and and others say 24 and three, probably because one of the pieces is an anti-lynching essay titled Hope that also includes some verse. This book is arranged into sections that have an ocean theme, and in the introduction, she talks about watching Italian children gathering driftwood, thinking about, quote, what a joyous sight it would be as they sat around the evening fire, and I imagined that the firelight streaming through the windows would brighten up the way of some weary homeward traveler. In a letter to Ella Wheeler Wilcox, she also said she'd called it driftwood because the pieces in it were, quote, Bits of Experiences Cast Up on the Shore of My Life. This volume contains a poem titled To the Memory of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Dunbar had died in 1906, and this poem has been compared to Phyllis Wheatley's On the Death of the Reverend Mr. George Whitfield for its subject matter and its tone and language. Driftwood also includes poems to Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, and William Lloyd Garrison. The poem, Kearney, the Brave Standard Bearer, is about Sergeant William H. Kearney of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, who was the first Black man to be awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions. That was at the Battle of Fort Wagner. After being shot several times and seriously wounded, Kearney carried the American flag to the fort, planted it, and held it upright until help arrived. It's actually possible that Bush had met Kearney. He lived in Boston and New Bedford, Massachusetts after the Civil War. This book also includes pieces that are more like poems of protest. One of them, titled Unchained, 1863, celebrates the abolition of slavery before the tone shifts to, quote, free indeed, but free to struggle, free to toil unceasingly. Not of wealth, not of possession was their portion, e'en though free. The same year that Driftwood was published, Olivia Ward Bush married Anthony Burrell Banks in Boston. And then the following year, Bush Banks was part of the city's demonstrations against D.W. Griffith's film, Birth of a Nation. This was part of ongoing protests all over the country as Black communities called for the film to be banned, not just for its racist depictions of Black people and its celebration of the Ku Klux Klan, but also for its potential to incite racist violence. All of our episodes overlap a little. (laughs) As you remember, we mentioned Griffiths in our Todd Browning episodes. I also feel like, as was the case with the Schomburg collection, feeling like a tour of previous episodes of Stuff You Missed in History Class, a lot of her poems feel like topics that should be familiar to folks that have been listening to the show for a long time. Yeah. Bush Banks organized a protest that took place on April 25th, 1915, and brought together about 800 Black women at 12th Baptist Church in Boston's Roxbury neighborhood. This was described as the largest gathering of Black women ever assembled in the city at the time, although Bush Banks herself could not attend it because she was sick. At this and other protests around Boston, people called for Birth of a Nation to be removed from the city and for Boston Mayor James Michael Curley to be recalled. 
Curley had previously banned the production of a play that, like Birth of a Nation, was based on the novel The Klansman, but he had allowed the film to be shown. Black women in Greater Boston also established a protective league, quote, for the maintenance and protection of our civil rights, and Bush Banks was elected as its president. In the face of this and other demonstrations, the Massachusetts legislature passed the Sullivan Bill, which banned amusements that were believed to create religious or racial prejudice or to incite riot. But when the censorship board evaluated Birth of a Nation after the law was passed, it ruled that the film was, quote, not at all objectionable. In the end, Birth of a Nation played in Boston for more than six months with more than 360 showings. And today, this film is cited as a major factor in the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan in 1915. Bush Banks's last published poem came out in 1916. This was On the Long Island Indian, which was published in the Montaukett Nation's annual report that year. This poem draws from tropes and language for indigenous people that were commonplace at the time, while also expressing a sense of grief. Quote, Now remains a scattered remnant. On these shores they find no home. Here and there, in weary exile, they are forced through life to roam. The only play that Bushbanks published came out a year later. This was a Sunday school play called Memories of Calvary, an Easter sketch. But other than these two publications, the poem and the play, we really don't know much about her life between 1915 and 1920. It seems that after marrying Anthony Banks, she eventually moved to Chicago, where he got a job as a Pullman porter. In about 1920, the NAACP printed a pamphlet about Bush Banks headlined Lecturer, Social Worker, Writer. It included quotes from people like Paul Lawrence Dunbar and Ella Wheeler Wilcox, as well as publications like the Chicago Plain Dealer. In it, she's described as a forceful and magnetic speaker, a remarkable writer, and, quote, possessed of a pleasing personality, a sympathetic nature with a broad mind and high ideals. At some point, Bushbank started splitting her time between Chicago and New York. Over the 1920s and early 30s, she wrote Aunt Viney's Sketches. This is a collection of 12 sketches featuring two characters. One of them, Aunt Viney, is in conversation with the other, who's Miss Ollie. Aunt Viney speaks in Black dialect, offering up folk wisdom, humor, and commentary on things like the Great Depression, the community of Harlem, New York, and various issues of the day. Bushbank submitted these to a radio station, and she started the process of filing for copyright protection on them, but it doesn't appear that that process was ever completed, and these pieces weren't published during her lifetime. In the hands of white writers in the early 20th century, these kinds of dialect characters tended to be racist caricatures that reinforced damaging stereotypes of Black people. But Aunt Viney was assertive, confident, and wise, while not being formally educated. This is one of the earliest examples of this type of dialect character written by a Black writer. Langston Hughes first introduced his character, Jesse B. Semple, about six years later. During these years that were split between Chicago and New York, Bushbanks also wrote a three-act play titled Indian Trails or Trail of the Montauk. Today, only the cast list, a synopsis, and a few scenes have survived. Most of the characters in the play are indigenous, with their names drawn from indigenous languages from northeastern North America. This play reflects on the 1910 court decision that we discussed earlier, but in the play, it ends with the Montaukett Nation's land being returned to them. This play was performed at Booker T. Washington High School in Norfolk, Virginia, probably sometime in the 1920s, as well as when Bush Banks took a tour of the Southeast. Many of its audiences were predominantly Black, and the play essentially served as an introduction to Indigenous issues for non-Indigenous Black people. Fans of the play included Maggie L. Walker, who was the first Black woman in the U.S. to charter a bank. In 1929, Bushbank's daughter Rosa Olivia died. At some point, the two of them had become estranged, and they hadn't been able to reconcile by the time of her death. By the late 1920s, Bush Banks had become well-known and well-respected in both Chicago and New York, including becoming a prominent figure in the New Negro Movement, also known as the Harlem Renaissance. 
She was friends and colleagues with figures like Paul Robeson, W.E.B. Du Bois, A. Philip Randolph, Julia Ward Howe, and County Cullen. She also taught drama in both Chicago and New York, in public schools and in enrichment programs. In Chicago, she established the Bush Bank School of Expression, which was a performance and meeting space for dance, drama, and visual arts. And she also hosted salons in her home. In 1936, a society column in the Pittsburgh Courier, which was featuring happenings in New York, called Bush Banks, quote, the grand dame of the literati, saying, quote, there was a time when her salon was filled of a Sunday evening with promising young playwrights, poets, novelists, and others, fired with the ambitions of youth. That same year, Bush Banks earned a teacher training certification in New York, and she started teaching drama at the Abyssinia Community Center in Harlem. This continued until 1939. Bush Banks' work at Abyssinia Community Center was part of the Works Progress Administration's Federal Theater Project. This was a Depression-era program meant to provide jobs for out-of-work theater professionals. It was disbanded in 1939 after a series of investigations by the House Un-American Activities Committee, which were brought on in part by the program's effort toward racial integration and equality. Yeah, there were also, of course, allegations that it had been infiltrated by communist radicals, as is pretty much the case with everything investigated by the House Un-American Activities Committee. Bushbank seems to have had an interest in religion and spirituality throughout her life, including an interest in the Baha'i faith, which may have influenced her work. She was also a member of John Haynes Holmes Community Church in New York City in the 1920s and early 30s. Toward the end of her life, she converted to Seventh-day Adventism. Her daughter, Marie, and her granddaughter, Helen, who she lived with from time to time while in New York, had also become Seventh-day Adventists. Olivia Ward Bush Banks died on April 8, 1944, at the age of 75. Most of her papers are housed at the Amistad Research Center at Tulane University in New Orleans. Apart from the work that we've talked about in this episode, plus a couple of other poems and essays, most of what she wrote went unpublished until 1991. And then Oxford University Press published her collected works. This was part of the Schomburg Library of 19th Century Black Women Writers, and it was edited and compiled by her great-granddaughter, Bernice Elizabeth Forrest. As of when we are recording this, the Montaukett Nation is still not recognized by the state of New York or by the federal government in the United States. The New York legislature passed legislation to recognize the nation in 2013, 2017, and 2018, and then Governor Andrew Cuomo vetoed it each time. Legislation has been reintroduced since 2018, including this year. As of right now, when we are recording, legislation has been referred to committee in both the New York State Assembly and the New York Senate. That's a frustrating end. Do you have less frustrating listener mail? It is a frustrating end. Uh, I do have listener mail, and this is just a funny thing to end the episode on. This is from Carly. Carly said, hi, Holly and Tracy. I'm so excited to finally be reaching out to you guys. My name is Carly, and I'm a high school Spanish teacher. I discovered your podcast a couple of years ago when starting my master's, and it has been a constant companion throughout the years. At least once a week, I share a fact or anecdote I heard in an episode that is totally interesting to me and may or may not be totally interesting to the other person. I wanted to reach out because on my way to school today, I was listening to the episode on William Rice. At the point in the episode where William is trying to start a high school in Texas and is met with the response, a quote, stating that high school was, quote, highfalutin nonsense, I couldn't help but busting out laughing. It was so funny to me to hear my career reduced to such a silly little statement. I then proceeded to giggle about it at regular intervals throughout the day. I think as we return to beginning the school year in person, many teachers held on to the hope that things would be easier, which has unfortunately not been the case. Teaching in a mid-slash-post-pandemic world has brought on an entirely new, unforeseen set of challenges that have been pushing us all. Thank you for bringing joy, learning, and a little silliness through this podcast. It has been my favorite way to unwind after a challenging day as of late. Best, Carly. P.S. And sticking with the pet pics theme of your fan mail, attached are pictures of mine and my fiancé's two fur babies, Danny the dog and Hank the cat. Danny and Hank are very cute. Yes, indeed. 
weed. Danny the dog is on the couch. Then Danny and the and the couch are both brown, and um, and it's one of those situations where the dog almost matches the couch, which is great. <laughs> and then, uh, and then Hank the cat is under what looks like a Christmas tree, little kitty cat present. It's very good. I love this email, and I also had forgotten in the interim between recording that episode and when we got this email that I had read a or one of us had had read this quote about high school being highfalutin nonsense. So when I saw an email that had the subject line highfalutin nonsense, I had this moment where I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> I was like, oh no, that's, that's a thing we said on the show. Um, so thank you. I'm so glad that that, uh, that quote brightened your day. And thank you so much for sending these pet pictures. If you would like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we're at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. We're also all over social media at Miss in History. That's where you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever else you get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.